All right, this is the Rex meeting for Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. This is our monthly check-in call. Um, and I'm going to start with a poem by Robert Graves titled, In Broken Images. He is quick, thinking in clear images. I am slow, thinking in broken images. He becomes dull, trusting to his clear images. I become sharp, mistrusting my broken images. Trusting his images, he assumes their relevance. Mistrusting my images, I question their relevance. Assuming their relevance, he assumes the fact. Questioning their relevance, I question the fact. When the fact fails him, he questions his senses. When the fact fails me, I approve my senses. He continues quick and dull in his clear images. I continue slow and sharp in my broken images. He, in a new confusion of his understanding, I, in new understanding of my confusion. Let me read that again. In Broken Images by Robert Graves. He is quick, thinking in clear images. I am slow, thinking in broken images. He becomes dull, trusting to his clear images. I become sharp, mistrusting my broken images. Trusting his images, he assumes their relevance. Mistrusting my images, I question their relevance. Assuming their relevance, he assumes the fact. Questioning their relevance, I question the fact. When the fact fails him, he questions his senses. When the fact fails me, I approve my senses. He continues quick and dull in his clear images. I continue slow and sharp in my broken images. He in a new confusion of his understanding, I in a new understanding of my confusion. I like, because I think, I think what we're doing is a sense-making journey and we are busy trying to figure out what are our images and what do our senses tell us and what do other people tell us and there's this whole notion of the scripts in our heads and, and how they seem to light up the road ahead and sometimes it's the wrong road. Um, so I thought that would be a nice place for us to start today. How is everybody? More or less good. good? I'm, in, I'm in Seattle, so yeah. Oh, interesting. How's Seattle? Oh, it's been lovely. Really lovely. Nice. Excellent. Um, does the poem suggest anything or, or light anything up for anyone? You know, I had a, a, a weird... Um, twinkling of the uh fox and the hedgehog mm -hmm. you know the fox uh, the hedgehog knows one great thing uh the fox knows many things you know this idea you know the fox is quick and you know, has touches on a whole bunch of things but never very deep the hedgehog is deep but only touches on one thing at a time and i'm not sure if there is an alignment or if that's basically a uh, um a contrast to the clear images and broken images. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it orthogonal or is it the same message? Right, and, and I I don't have an answer for that, but that was just what popped mm -hmm. into my head as I was listening. What showed up? It's funny I, that the fox and hedgehog thing shows up now and then, and I'm never quite sure what to make of it or even how to describe myself because I feel like I'm a hedgehog with fox-like attributes, and I'm sure that that would make Berlin like crazy. Um, because I, I, I'm like, I care about so many different things. I'm really broad in that way, but I can go deep on a bunch of things. So it's, I, I, I can never quite harness the, the saying in different ways. Hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor. Denise Caruso. You're a, a, fox, a fox hedgehog hybrid. Interesting. I like it. A I raccoon. Like it. A raccoon. I'm not a raccoon. <laughs> a raboon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a dog either, or a fox. Um, hey, let's have, let's have everybody check in, uh, Jerry. No, yeah, that sounds won't. great. Would you like to take us in? <laughs> How about that? Well, I'm reading my second translation of the Odyssey. Uh-huh. And I've been contrasting that with the Bible, because, you know, it is really the, the cultural transmission document of the Greeks. And, um, and then I read this great essay on uh, the Odyssey. 
and it, it, it really shows a very radical difference actually from the Christian ethos and Jew, Judea, Jewish ethos. Mm -hmm. And it was that uh, the Odyssey is all about, uh, they even use it in Greek in the original, uh, uh, desicizing, you know, it's a, uh, he's, he's actually uses the verb and it's about, yeah, you can have your perfect life with Calypso, this goddess who wants him, you know, and hangs out there. You can have heaven, like the Christians provide have this heaven. He has it with Calypso and he doesn't want it. He wants life's storm and strum and challenge and death. And it's so great to think that that's how that, that, that was valued by the Greeks. They never messed around with this. You know, when you die, it's going to work out for you. Take life on by the, by, you know, by the horns now. Mm -hmm. Live it. And mm -hmm. to think that, that the, the, one of the base documents of their culture is about that, you know? So I'm, I'm really excited about what I'm learning. And I've been comparing, contrasting George Eliot with, with Fielding and just seeing, because you know that well-educated Europeans knew both documents. And I've been looking at, like, in, in Tom, Tom Jones, for example, he's more of a Greek hero, you know, hmm. but he's called an anti-hero in the West because, you know, he has sex and he does, you know, <laughs> he has fun. Um, whereas George Eliot, she has very, you know, more black and white heroes and heroines along the Christian lines. Of course, she herself was... Anyway, so that's what I'm doing. I love that. And in, in part, um, multiple things. Partly, partly you're sort of leaning toward the kinds of things that I'm looking forward to us having a pop-up call about, which is, you know, how, how are the insights of the Victorian era uh, relevant to the quest that we're on here? Um, partly, I'm also reminded of origin stories and how they work because April is deep into a dive into yoga and the history, you know, the origins of yoga and the history of yoga. So I'm going to ask her to check in next um, because I, I think that maybe this resonated just a, a wee little bit. Um, let's, let's do a little bit of that now. Yeah, that'd be fun. Exactly. <laughs> is that over to me? <laughs> yeah. If, if you don't mind. Um, sure. So it's good to reconnect with everybody. It's, it's been a while. Um, last couple months at least I've been mostly gone I am in the midst of well various things on the like portfolio front and whatnot but the most significant update I think is that I'm in the midst of a 200 hour course which is technically yoga teacher training course so I will be certified to teach yoga at the end um, that's not the primary reason I'm doing it although I like I like the certification. Um, it's more to go to dive deeper into the history and philosophy and beyond the physical practice. And so we're learning about everything from the Vedas and the Upanishads to Yamas, if, if any of these terms um, resonate or have been heard by any of you. Um, and interestingly, so it's basically it's a 11 week course and it's 20 hours a week. So it's, uh, as Jerry knows, it's the studio has become my second home and consumes my entire weekends and much of the week as well. Um, this is the first time that I have really studied something like this in a course kind of format since um, grad school. That feels really good. It's also a bit of an adjustment. Um, it is worth mentioning, uh, my class has about 25 people and the youngest is actually in college. And the oldest is in his mm, late 70s. So a really, neat, a really neat breadth to show kind of yoga on many, um, many ages. And then also in my class, we have people from China, from Portugal, from Germany, from Ireland, and pretty much every corner of the U.S. So it's really fun also to learn about yoga through different languages and that kind of thing. Last weekend, coincidentally, we did do a piece of the history of yoga. And so, funnily enough, Bo, um, the Odyssey came up. And just the, the overlay, not the Odyssey with, specifically with relation to, to um, yoga, but what was happening elsewhere around the world. And so learned about, you know, its origins basically in ca the caves of the Himalaya and then how it ended up in India and then how it ended up, you know, its entry into the U.S. and Western civilization is very, very new. And by uh, it, you mean yoga here, Yoga. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yoga didn't show up in the U.S. until basically um, the early 1950s. Uh, but, but its history within, yo within India and, and all of that. But then looking at even, it didn't show up in India until much later as well. Um, 
but looking at what was happening around the same time, that in particular, so the, the Vedas were the earliest, basically, scribes and scriptures, and those date back to about 1500 BC. None of them were written down. It was all oral. And then the, the Upanishads are the first written record. Those show up in India, roughly 400 BC. Uh, and by that point, you know, we're into the classical era. And so then there was just an interesting conversation. Anyway, not that we need to get into all the historical details. I think for me, the biggest update is really one, on a personal level, taking the time to invest this amount of time and stuff that's not related necessarily to what I do and uh, kind of go through this other, this whole other process, which is far beyond the physical. But I think it's, as Jerry knows, it's, it's cracking open sort of new parts of me, which is really exciting. And then secondly, on the professional note, I think it's very clear to me that this training is going to show up in what I do in my portfolio, in the dots that I connect, in all of that, not necessarily teaching yoga, but you know, the work that I'm doing on these other fronts, whether it's the new economy or citizenship or whatever. And I'm really enjoying, although struggling a little bit, you know, to, to, to sort of trust the process of... Um, how is it going to show up? What are those connections? Really leaning into some very new space in the hopes of being able to, I guess you could say, level up everything that I'm doing. So I will pause there. Uh, just a couple things, April. Christy did the, my wife Christy did the, did the same thing you did. Not to, not to become a teacher, but learned all that like you did. And oh, you know, fabulous. And I think it was really rewarding and enriching for her. Yeah, that's kind of how I'm feeling right now is to just sort of trust the process and dive as deep as I can and prioritize it as much as I can and not worry about, well, what is that outcome? Because um, I can tell already that personally, it's profoundly, profoundly helpful and satisfying. Um, it's just the question of whether or not there is some other layer. So thank you. When we're in week right now, we're in week four of 11, just to give everybody a sense of where I am in this journey. So the next monthly call, I'll still be in the class. And the one after that will be done. And I, I have to riff off 400 BC. So, so interesting how the Bible, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and, and the Upanishads all earn like a 300 year period of time that all these cultures manifest that. It's really astonishing that these origin stories really aren't not that separate from each other in time. Yeah, it just makes me really question or find it hard not to believe or not to imagine that there wasn't just either some kind of special energy in the, on the planet at that point in time or more interaction and inter-exchange than we generally tend to think is the case. I wonder if there's also an element of that's when it became... Uh became more possible to create create texts that could be handed down. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so. the, his, the, the history of writing affects this whole thing because most many of these traditions are oral, 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 oral. And, and there's really interesting aspects of oral traditions, sort of like, right. like, like folk music. It's, folk music is very different from music written down as notes and then that's the song. Um, so I think the, uh, the oral traditions are, have their own fascination. Uh, and then writing... I don't know this. I'd love to get a historian who understands the effects of writing to come into our conversation. Um, hey, Bill. And uh, to sort of note this, because writing affects the stories in different ways and, and kind of pins them down, also makes them more accessible. And, you know, with the advent of the paperback, uh, democratizes the texts in, in ways that are interesting. So I think all, of these, all of these things figure in. Um, also, there's, you know, the, the axial age, which is when a lot of the big religious leader, leaders show up is, is sort of also a band here that, that that's worth talking about. Um, and it's all, these are all the deep rooted stories of our lives, right? And, and different cultures use these texts as their foundational documents and, 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 and they've got their different journeys and their, their different struggles and their different, uh, uh, they form like the backdrop of, of all the civilizations of our and I, I will add that we're living with the effects of those stories today, every day. Exactly. And, but we, and we also frame how life treats us and what our realm of possibilities are within the frameworks of these stories in different ways. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And April, uh, as you've been sort of looking at the, um, um, as you've been hearing some of the stories of the origins 
uh, and you haven't, you know, I mean, you haven't been become a scholar of the Vedas or anything like that. So I'm not, I'm not asking that, but, but have aspects of the stories resonated with your own journey in different ways? Can you just call, call, uh, call that up a bit? Oh, completely. So it's less about, we don't learn a lot of, thus far. We haven't learned a lot of the stories except for the well-known ones, like when, you know, a princess gets kidnapped to, to Sri Lanka. and Like the Ramayana or something. Exactly. Not, and that just shows up almost anecdotally. What we've focused on more, and here, let me grab it real quick so I can read them for you. Um, these things called the Yamas and the Niyamas. Um, so Y-A-M-A and N-I-Y-A-M-A. And they're easy enough to find online. But um, basically, the yamas are things that you seek. They're principles. And they're sort of five yamas and five niyamas. And the yamas are things that you seek to steer away from, like externally. And then the niyamas are things you seek to turn towards or, you know, lean into internally. And so it's everything from, you know, the truthfulness, truthfulness non-stealing, moderation, non-harming, non-hoarding things like that but it's a really broad like we do a deep dive into one of we take one of those things per week and spend two to three hours just looking at one principle and talking about it and learning about it and this and the other and i just bring up one for example which is um like non-stealing which is the third yama it's called asteya in sanskrit but non-stealing where we can think of that as okay not stealing, you know, a lot, lot, a lot of times it's physical possessions and things like that. But they said, no, you know, this is about every kind of stealing possible. This is, and the most common one these days is also, what are the things that we do that steals, that steal or robs our time? Right? I mean, that's a form. You seek to steer away from anything in which you're stealing of something from yourself or something from someone else. So robbing one's time, and that's not just spending time on social media, that's the negative thoughts in our brain, that's all of these other things that I don't typically think of as stealing, but it's absolutely robbing myself of becoming my full, you know, reaching my full potential or doing the things I want to do. Um, obviously, you also then end up in, in conversations about stealing from others, stealing also for the, for this tradition absolutely meant you cannot steal anything most of all from the, from the earth. So then you get into, um, you know, extractive practices, sustainability, supply chain, all of that sort of stuff as well. So I use that just as one example of a nugget that we take that nugget of this principle that we seek to attain a, a, a reality of non-stealing. And then we just peel back the layers of that onion. And, and, and for me, that's been extremely eye-opening, um, also really comforting to realize how even more than I thought before is connected and what it means though to change some of my own lifestyle and practices to be more in alignment with what these yamas and niyamas say because at the end of the day, quite totally candidly, when I read through all of them, it's the closest thing that I've, and I, I don't describe it as religion in any way, shape or form, but in terms of a path of life, it is a very, very well-marked path. And there's not a single thing about anything that we haven't learned thus far that I don't profoundly agree with and just kind of want to get, like, um, allow it to sort of seep in as much as possible at a cellular level, if that makes sense. What's your meditation practice looking like now, April? Um, not much actually. Um, well, I shouldn't say not much other than, so there are some, so I haven't meditated, um, explicitly prior to, well, in general at all. I, I do a little bit in the morning stuff that I kind of make up. Um, we are, there's meditation that's part of some of the classes that we take. And as Jerry knows, I'm I'm taking at least one, often two, and on one day, three classes in a day. So I'm in the studio a lot. So there's a whole lot of meditation that is showing up through the classes that I'm taking. But it's a great question because it's one of those things where it's not an explicit part of the course, but there's a very much sort of indirect tangential, it's right there on the side piece of it. And I think I know that in the second half of the course, we go deeper in it, so we haven't yet. 
Um, and I also know that it's one of those things, as soon as a little bit of time frees up from the yoga piece, that I want to explore deliberately more further on my own as well. So sorry, I don't have a, like a huge, like a, a fantastic answer, but it's, at this point, it's been thus, um, thus far, it's been more combined with the other stuff. But if we were to talk at the end of the class, I will probably have more to share. I mean, I asked because I, my, Claude and I have been doing a, like a kind of a monthly sangha that we've, we've carried over from um, Virginia with our neighbors, but now we're having to do it on Zoom because we don't live in Virginia anymore. And, and we're not meditating, but we're participating in the sangha and listening to the Rinpoche and having these really interesting discussions. And it's kind of, you know, so I've been puzzling over this, you know, split between not wanting to practice, but really enjoying kind of the, the intellectual piece. I do feel guilty about not doing the practice. What is a samba, David? What is samba, David? Sangha. Sangha. You know, so it's it's kind of six or eight people. We get together. We watch this guy. This guy uh, from Nepal has put together a video series where he gives a, a lecture for twenty minutes or so. So we all watch the lecture. We meditate. We discuss the lecture. You know, we trade stories about each other, and it's you know it's probably the closest to spirituality spirituality that I have in my life right now because I've you know I'm a church. But, uh, but it's, it's pretty meaningful and we feel like we're learning a lot from it. And, you know, I really should be meditating, but you know, I haven't gotten there. Yeah. Uh, Dave, we're, we're just in the, in the process of checking in. April, do you want to add to that? Um, no, no, we're good. I may come back later. Thanks. Okay. I was just going to see if Dave, would, uh, if Dave wanted to check in. Uh, sure. I mean, I guess I, I was, none of my stuff is as interesting as what you guys are up to. Uh, the last couple of weeks have been focused particularly around, I mean, you know, the, the, pretty much all of the free thinking I do is around regeneration. How do we motivate a regenerative future? Um, so last week I went to Kevin Jones's uh, conference on uh, regenerative economics and spent several days there. Uh, how, how was that? Yeah. How was that? Yeah. How was that? Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was grumpy about it. Uh, you know, I hate the format. It was all sage on a stage. You know, the uh, leaders of the conference wanted to lecture everybody. There's a lot of people getting lectured in the conference. Um, so that was really irritating. They had an open space component on the last day after they closed the conference, kind of, um, so which just drove me nuts. Um, it did. They had, the open space sessions I went to had pretty good energy, though, so it kind of survived the, the, the attempt to kill it. Um, mm -hmm. It was a pretty good group of people, I think. In some sense, it was what I consider to be the core of people who are thinking about regeneration, you know, at least in the States or in this part of the States. So, you know, Hunter Lovings was there, and, and, um, she, and one of the things that signaled was that she was willing to cooperate in a way that I didn't really didn't expect that she would. Um, so she showed up. Oh, interesting. Talked, and, you know, they were kind of... They, they in, her, in her cowboy hat? In her cowboy hat, yep, exactly. Um, the, cap the folks from Capital Institute, that's why I ran into Stuart Kalman. I don't know if he's responded to you yet, but I do think there's really interesting overlap between the stuff you guys are thinking. Um, yeah, thank you, that's a good uh, connection. You know, Kevin, Kevin's just, you know, he stumbled across this idea six months ago and, you know, he's all excited about it. And he wants to do another session based on indigenous behavior and return to, the indi in return to indi indigeneity, I think he's calling it. Oh, like, interesting. Oh, um, I mean, he's been doing neighborhood economics and a lot of in, like, like work with indigenous population for, for a while. Right? Like neighborhood economics is a big, big theme for him. Um, so he's been, uh, been, been doing that. So, so it was fun. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was interesting. It was probably useful. You know, it, it wasn't as big a tent as I was hoping. I was hoping, you know, I'd love to have this kind of vague concept of regeneration be you know, a direction for all of the globe, kind of. It seems to me that it's a, it basically, I think the core narrative is it's a, a positive sum view of the world. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and basically all the organizations that see the world as positive sum should be supporting each other in that. And, you know, Bob's your uncle. Um, and so there, there, you know, he had some of the neighborhood economics folks. He had, uh, there's a big core regenerative agriculture folks. You know, they kind of see themselves in the space already. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a smattering of folks who were doing other kinds of things, but um, not as many. There wasn't new. There wasn't a lot of new democracy people. The, the new, the new economics people weren't there. Um, you know, there's other kind of cohorts that I would kind of wish to come, but maybe next. It, yeah, it'd be really interesting to to brainstorm to think through who are the groups that would have been really useful to have there. Yeah. 
like that, you know, like like uh, uh, Doug Carmichael and the new econo- new economic thinking, you know, INET and all that. Like, I would love that, to do those, like that. Those little those little mashups, uh, very different communities, would be super to do, and and maybe even as a as a format for. Um, you know, next year's conference or something like that to, to do a little super collider where you bring together um, these different unlikely couples and say, hey, how do your ideas uh, mash together? What, what happens when, when we think about this together? I like that a lot. Well, and that's been, so, you know, kind of growing up and coming out of the conference of so productive things. I've ended up having a really good conversation with, I can't pronounce his name right, Fyodor. You know him, he's a Russian guy working with Manuel Ortega, uh, the Institutional Evolutionary Leadership Institute, I think is what they call their thing. Fyodor, um, hmm, I don't know him. What's his last name? Uh, can you try to try to pronounce it again? Yeah, I'll, let me try to. Let me just uh, see if I can. Because <laughs> right now I just I would type random characters for what you said. Yeah, right. That's pretty much where I would get you to. Let me see if That's I can. Right. Uh, let me just send you the. Uh, cool. In the chat. But, um, and so we ended up talking about kind of what's the regenerative internet look like and having some, you know, just kind of trying to think about what, it, you know, what's a protocol of, of this network and, and what ties it together. And, hmm. and that's been in conversation around narrative. So it's in my mind, I guess I'm wondering if, if narrative is in some sense, the glue that holds the network together. And it doesn't, doesn't have to be a, a grand expansive network narrative. What you really want is just a core. You just want, enough overlap mm-hmm. that you kind of agree that we're allies, you know, and that you're willing to play together. Um, so what would that look like? So we're kind of, and, and I was thinking, we're thinking in terms of, it's all, you know, going back to internet metaphors, right? So I, I think we're going to try to draft the, the first request for comment on the uh, regenerative internet and, uh, you know, try to try to put some thoughts out there about what it, what, what the kind of behaviors and rules of, of play would be if there were all these different groups were connected. How would that, what would that look like? That's really interesting. Yeah, I like that. Well, the idea that narrative is something that binds a group together, the, the, the word that comes to mind for me is myth. Mm-hmm. That it's actually that there are core myths to many groups and that myth does not have, have to mean falsehood, but it means a, a narrative that imparts um, history and meaning through, through the course of a um, essentially of a fiction. That fiction can be very close to reality. Yeah, remember the Alamo, it's a good one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know, and so you can have, you know, so it'd be actually really interesting, what, what do you think is the origin myth for Rex, Jerry? Or not an origin myth, but what is the myth underlying Rex? Um, well, that the myth trust matters. It's interesting. No, I, I mean, the, the thing I say a lot that I believe quite deeply is that long ago, we used to understand how to live in community on the commons. And that is my personal myth. And uh, I, I, I kind of hew to that because I use it to contrast with models of humanity's ascent from violent, tribal, stupid nature which I, I, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think, I think we, we long ago figured out a lot of good stuff that we managed to stamp out. In fact, are, are busy rediscovering now in kind of naive ways. Um, so, so that's a piece of it, I think. And then there's another part of it, which is about trust, which is related because if you know how to live in community on the commons, there's a lot of things that you're trusting about what it means to be in community, about how nature acts and reacts, about how you interact with nature and you know about observation all that all that sort of factors in um, so I think there's there's aspects of, of trust here where where the myth is that um, acting from a basis of trust is better than leads to better outcomes than not and, and uh, that I'm phrasing that not as a myth so much as just a belief maybe but but I think I could point to stories I tell um, it's interesting to frame this as myths because there are stories I tell as examples of these different beliefs I have. Mm-hmm. I love your question, Jermaine, by the way. And your, you know, myths being false is a, is a modern pastiche on the word. What the word right. actually means is oral tradition. That's what myth means. That's the original definition. Yeah. So, Jermaine, I love where you went there. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is how many myths 
that are deeply important to cultures are violent, misogynist, uh, horrible things. Like, like they're, they're dramatic tales, but many of them are not things you'd want to live through. Yeah, I'm reading uh, the book too just you know for the contrast <laughs> there's a lot in there it's pretty it's gross. insane it's insane yeah yeah um so in the, in the spirit of checking in bill how you doing uh you're muted yeah bill's muted uh you're still muted everybody do this to bill yeah bill we can't hear you okay unmuted. there we go now you're unmuted now you're in computers um, yeah exactly my overlay to what Jamey was saying is to add to the myth a visceral element. In other words, I'm, I'm reading, I posted them, some books, uh, Immortal Self by Arvinda Imadra, which is basically getting into the, the, the effect of the Amartya masters in Tibet. Uh, and But more important, the Biology of Transcendence by Joseph Chilton Pierce which he, he really gets into both the mechanics of biology and in essence, the transcendence part, which is that, that there's a field effect. In other words, if you take the morphogenic field concepts, Rupert Sheldrake, et cetera, the mm -hmm. fact that in essence, a felt body experience, a visceral experience of what's going on in the world, to me is what's wrapped up in the myth making. And whether they're stories that we're making now or experiences that we're having now and getting together and reaching results through relationship, to me is the reinforcing aspect of, of the field. In other words, the field is gonna hold whatever has been and whatever is. And to the extent that there's more of the has been, in other words, more experience of you know, what's in the Bible or whatever, and that if you're a fundamentalist, you're committed to that being real, you know, whereas for 2,000 years, yes, okay, maybe patriarch and, and male domination has been real, but before that, for 3,000 years, it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. so they had to remake it, and they did it in a very violent way to, to take control of that myth-making. And so now we're going back to well, what are the alternatives? And to me, that's the fundamental shift that Rex is about, going back and, and getting a sense as to what's really possible through relationship as opposed to domination. Because we've sort of exhausted, reached the end of the potential, or at least we're feeling the tension of the end of the potential of domination. In other words, I want it and I want it now, as opposed to, I would really like to have a better feeling about this. So, you know, I may want to get, let's say, you know, a good house, but if it's a tiny house and I've got a good community around it, isn't that better than just having a house, you know, that's twice as expensive or five times as expensive as I really need, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the relationship aspect is becoming more and more you know, sort of like in our face or in our sense. And, and to me, that's part of the myth. In other words, a myth isn't just a story. It's, it's a sense that you're, yeah, that really did, you know, I, I get it, you know, what that myth was about. And that's what we're trying to do is re, redo our myths, but do so them in a way that feels better. So I'm going to sit in my way, Rex as cultural engineers. Right. Hmm. And, and if you take that phrase, cultural engineers, and really, really, really go deep, you realize that it doesn't happen by just having, let's say, a white paper. It has to happen viscerally. It has to happen mm -hmm. in the room. It has to happen here, not here. Right. And, and, and to take that as a step further, Gay Hendricks' work basically really gets into what he calls a 10-second miracle, which is where you concentrate on making sure that you feel it here as opposed to in your head. In other words, okay, you had that idea, you know, that this is wrong or this is right. Where did you feel that in your body? Because where you feel it, if it's in the throat or the shoulders, is different than if it's in the heart area as opposed to the stomach area. And if you start paying attention to that, you start paying attention to the field effect of what's going on. In other words, it's not just about you as just you in your head. It's you as a, an accumulation, and as an exchange with the relationship environment that you're in. 
And, and the, just going back to, you know, what comes out of all this, is the fundamental shift has got to come in the sense of our having more experiences of feeling safe in relationship. In other words, too much of our marketing and consumerism and business control orientation it starts from the assumption of scarcity, and I've got to go get it and make it mine. Mm -hmm. I, I like how, by the way, uh, safe, I think, is related to trust. Absolutely. Totally. 100%. You know, and that's, that's a very difficult thing to wrap your head around because of the fact that at the end of the day, trust, to an extent, if you go back to some of the original work that was going on, comes from you trusting you first. Because the more you don't trust you, then in essence, you're going to put up armor, you're going to put up protective shields, you're going to, you're, you're going to have not trust come first until it's proven. All of this stuff, which, which if you can trust you to stop hurting you, then no matter what happens in the world, you're safe because you're going to be able to deal with it. You know, the, it's going to rain, there's going to be lightning, there are going to be problems that occur, there are going to be relationship issues. But if you trust that you can handle all that, then you can allow more trust in the world around you. Mm -hmm. if you're not and, defensive. And, and partly this is the grace with which you deal with everything incoming. Right. Um, and if you trust yourself more, you're able to deal with all those things better in different ways. It's interesting. Right. Uh, in, in the spirit of check-in, Bill, are these things live for you right now in activities Absolutely. you've got on the, on the ground? And can Absolutely. you just describe Absolutely. a little bit how? <laughs> um, we're, we're, in our Center for Social Change, we have challenges from time to time, and, and one of our couples is getting a divorce right now. And so, in essence, they're fighting over equipment. And we just happened to find some of the equipment and I, I put it in our locked environment. And so I'm negotiating with them to be able to, to resolve these things. But one of the things that, that I've asked the woman, because she's the one that's more had challenges in her life. In other words, a very difficult growing up with a mother that was totally control oriented and, and made life difficult for her, et cetera. I want her to do breath work. And so, you know, because that's the place where you can finally start to take your own responsibility for your own improvement. In other words, creating a better relationship with the world, because you clearly grew up in an environment where you couldn't trust the world. You couldn't trust your mother. So at the end of the day, getting her to a point where she can trust that is something that we're constructing. In other words, fortunately, her psychologist likes the breathwork person that I use and I've done, you know, eight sessions with him and, and all of this kind of stuff. In other words, to deal with my own issues. And I'm going to a retreat next week in Rhythmia. Is anybody familiar with Rhythmia uh, down in Costa Rica? I've heard of it, but know nothing about it. They, they do a combination of, of both breathwork and Ayurve Ayur uh, Ayur Ayahuasca. Hmm. You know, so they, they, I, can, I can go deeper into the whole process. But, but it's issues of where your, your lack of trust are. You know, in other words, what are the ingredients so that you can unwrap that and be safer in play? In other words, that's the, the bottom line of, of Chilton Pierce's work is that our real purpose in life is to play. Mm -hmm. But we don't feel safe enough to be willing to do that. And it's that challenge. I'm sure everybody on this call is aware of the attachment theory. In other words, uh, Bowlby and the concept that, you know, at, at age one, we either are attracted to, in other words, rely on our mother to be safe so that we can explore, or we don't, at which point we, we become very controlling and anxious and, and acting out with respect to issues of ex exploration. And so if you can play at exploration, in other words, it's okay to play at it with the expectation you're not attached to the result and you're not dependent on the result because you know that you can be safe even if you play wrong, that's fine. But we're not there yet. We're not, we're, we're still in a control because we think that we have to control the outcome in order to be able to, to be good at it, to be able to get the good outcomes. You know, and obviously there are a lot of spiritual things that say, no, that's not true. You can get awfully good outcomes without being in control. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what the immortal self uh, book is about. In other words, that, that we're coming to that kind of tension within culture and society that is 
propelling us to explore trust, which to me is what we're doing on this call every, every time we get together. We're exploring it so that we can start to be more trusting of it. Thank you. And, and thank you also. I, I really like how safety has made an appearance in this conversation. And it's just so relevant in so many ways. It's a, it's a very nice lens through which to see trust uh, and our relationships to it over time. Yeah, thank you. Um, Todd, do you want to jump in? Todd, you're muted and uh, you may not have heard what I just said. So uh, maybe we jump to Mark. Oh, the Todd's coming uh, in. I'm, yeah, I just needed to do multiple controls there. Ah. Uh, I'm not on video today because I'm preparing to leave for a little trip, but um, I really appreciate the richness of this conversation. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is on, on last month's call, uh, S.D. Solomon um, took us into a project that's kind of been uh, embedded deep within her for a number of years around a new grammar of productivity. Uh, and I've been able to spend, oh, uh, almost five hours with her since then. Uh, and I think in the next month we will have a group call around where that project is at and the input that is needed and uh, to get your responses, but it's a very Rexy endeavor to think about if we get away from tasks and goals, what are the ways in which we can remind ourselves how to have an impact in the world? How me as an individual, what is, what is helping bring me back into a place of impact? Uh, so I, I've really enjoyed that, and I look forward to taking that, helping SD take that to the larger group. That's awesome. Uh, and, and just a, and just a reflection, when you said remind, and you pause between the, the, the syllables a little bit, I'm reminded that a lot of what she talks about is multi-minding, and she plays a lot with the meaning yes. of mind. So to remind is not just to remember, or to remind somebody, but rather to re-articulate and reshape and rethink your mind itself. So I, that, that took me, just the way you said the word, took me deeper into that right there. And that was unintentionally intentional, mm -hmm. um, because that is the focus to be able to uh, move between minds to essentially tend different areas of our self and life. Uh, and I think the most relevant update is that I have a new client that is both a uh, joy and a stretch. Um, so a, an organization called Courage Together uh, that has had a corporate government and nonprofit training program called Respectful Confrontation. Uh, for over 10 years. Um, for those of you who have known me for a while, you know that I'm passionate about embodiment. So uh, April, I was so much enjoying what you were saying and knowing that it's going to have an impact and you don't exactly know how. Uh, but this training program is the first that I've witnessed that actually brings embodiment practices uh, into a C-suite, uh, and it's around four pillars of personal power being uh, grounding, focus, flexibility, and strength. And there's practices, um, there's theory, and then there's practices for each of those, those pillars that have come from Tai Chi, martial arts, uh, and other forms of Eastern spirituality. Um, so I am deep in that now, understanding the theory and then understanding the pragmatic elements of uh, what does the business need and uh, what is the, the story that needs to be told. Um, but I'm, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to step back and see that more and more projects coming my way are ones that I have a deeper level of care about. 
uh, fewer clients than which uh, I have to force myself to do something in order to uh, keep the uh, the work flowing in and and more projects that are meaning filled. Love that. Um, Mark, how's uh, how's with you? Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of themes in this discussion so far that resonate, and uh, actually, in terms of minds, um, I've been thinking a lot about that because uh, you know we talk about intelligence, artificial intelligence. Um, how do we get ethics into our software? And uh, I, I love the Sanskrit word chitta, C-I-T-T-A, because it, it means both heart and mind. And, and, I, and I've been struggling to find, you know, is there an English equivalent? And I, I have not come across that. Um, but I think it's important in terms of, you know, the words we use kind of uh, identify what our ontologies Apologies for using that term a little bit, but uh, you know what 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 that is. And uh, anyway, so that that, that that's a uh, kind of one one theme. Um, another is locality and globality, or local and global. So I, I'm preparing to take part in this uh, program here in Nova Scotia, in Canada, called How We Thrive. And this is put together by some of the people who put together the ALIA, Authentic Leadership in Action program that happened over I think, 11 years a while ago. And those are kind of more global, but this is local. And I think that uh, uh, that relationship between lo local and global is really important. So, for example, I've been looking at the uh, summaries of the 14 finalists um, Todd, I think it might be noise on your end, but some one of us is uh, putting a lot of noise into the channel. Sorry, can uh, can you mute? Go ahead, Mark. Sorry. Uh, I was looking. There was this Global Challenges Foundation contest uh, to come up with uh, new shapes and paradigms of global cooperation, governance, and collaboration. And they had twenty seven hundred uh, proposals submitted. I mean, I, I did one myself, and uh, there were fourteen finalists. And looking at them. The, uh, I'm trying to identify, here's a great opportunity for harvesting what are ostensibly some of the best ideas about dealing, you know, with the world, e even though I recognize that the selection process for coming down to 14 was probably highly individual and, you know, I probably would have done differently, you would have done differently too. Um, but that local to global aspect, I think, is very much there. And, and I think there's a lot of hope in terms of starting on a kind of ground up basis and, and working up. So, you know, people have ideas on, uh, uh, you know, clubs of cities and uh, starting on a lower, lower than nation state uh, level. And, that's for, and, that's, and that resonates with this How We Thrive conference uh, that I'm looking for ways of, well, maybe how do I contribute that kind of dimension to? Um, so, the, uh, and, and in terms of yoga and uh, myth and so on, it all, all seems to come back to, you know, how do we work with our heart minds, not just our minds, but our heart minds. And, and is that kind of just uh, whistling in the dark? Because, you know, we always say, oh, it's only human. People will always be this way. So what's the point of trying to work on this kind of level of, you know, directly working with our minds and our intentions? Um, but I, th I think over the course of history, we do change. I mean, certain things are no longer acceptable in civilization. You know, we're still struggling with others. Um, and also, I think one new thing, and this has become much more apparent the last number of years, is the extent to which our tool systems, the kind of technologies we create, feed back on our own minds, on our own hearts, and our ability to have wisdom and to act wisely, to perceive correctly. So, you know, like one of the takes I have from uh, uh, kind of, I mean, the, the surface of the iceberg is, is Facebook and, you know, Cambridge Analytica and so on. But it seems like what's been going on is that uh, kind of semi-blindly going along with the business model of, oh, we have the greatest technology, let's make it available for free, how do we pay for it, ads, how do we, uh, uh, optimize ads, 
Well, it's a race to the bottom, basically. So our, I saw the study saying our average attention span has gone down from like 8.6 to six seconds, and we're monetizing fragmented attention. And then that has our effect, an effect on how, as a supposed democracy, for example, how we deal with our own issues. So there's this interesting feedback from the tool system back to the human system, where basically we're destroying the very root of our awareness. And uh, that's an, you know, for someone who's worked in the internet and techie area for decades, this is very sobering, showing how, uh, yeah, of course we're good, well-intentioned, et cetera, um, but still we're, we're conducting like a mass experiment on literally billions of people. And, uh, and we're seeing some of the results. Uh, anyway, so those are some of the, the themes I've been uh, kind of working on. Love that. And the conference sounds super interesting. Can, can I pick up? Um, Please. Thanks, Mark. Um, just one other thing, and this is more of a horizon, um, a horizon topic, but um, Mark, you just mentioned it, and it's going far beyond the yoga piece and so forth, but um, I did want to let everyone know that I continue my deeper dive into what I originally was theming as, it, it, basically I'm building on the piece about uh, local and global and what's happening to the nation state and, and all of that. Um, and it's what I called initially last year more the theme of global citizenship and so forth, which is definitely still on my radar, but it's expanded in recent um, months to really look more broadly at this notion of citizenship, this notion of belonging and identity and borders. And, you know, we have free flow of, pretty much everything in terms of ideas, capital, technology, etc. And looking at citizenship and even things like passports as a relatively new phenomenon, a very new phenomenon, in fact. Um, and looking at, if I look to the future, and Jemay, you might have looked at some of this as well, I don't know. But, you know, looking to the future, um, I think we're entering, entering, the best term I can come up with is a new era of citizenship. Um, I don't even know that we call it citizenship, um, but when it comes to belonging, identity, loyalty, all of that, where we're looking at more local and more global, we're looking at multiple layered identities, we're looking at certain identities and affiliations and quote unquote citizenships that you might have for business reasons versus cultural reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And increasingly, I strongly believe that we will see a lot of change in the coming years or decades around how we identify and how we hold a set of rights and responsibilities to different places and different people. And so I, I mention that because one is I'd love to host a Rex call on this sometime. Two, if people have ideas around this, I'm like a giant sponge. Um, I am writing more about this. Uh, I have written a couple pieces already, have a lot more in the queue. And um, you know, I, I continue to do my work around the future of work and new economy and all of that. But for those of you who have known me for a while, um, I do like getting into ideas that are, are nascent and more emergent. And the more I'm picking apart this particular theme, the more I think it's probably what ends up being that, that, that additional layer on my portfolio in the coming years. So I say this because, you know, picking up on the local versus global, looking at this in terms of from modern history, we don't have a lot of comparables to lean into. And I, I'm not, for the record, I'm not saying that like passports disappear. I'm just saying that it's going to become, well, it's everything from virtual citizenship for sale, e-residency, global impact visas, all of that. But then obviously you end up in conversations about stateless people and looking at citizenship also as a bargaining chip, brokerage chip, you know, there's both the potential for, for really great things around uh, mobility of talent and education and so forth, and also um, very, you know, thorny issues around corruption. Um, all I'll say, Malta is the best example to look at for that at the moment, um, and so on and so forth. So, sorry, I went on a little longer than I thought, but I wanted to put that out there because it's something I'm up to something I haven't been able to share within this group um, for the last few months and an open offer to noodle on this more together anytime. 
Um, April, you should look at the uh, Institute for the Future's 2017 10-year forecast material, which should be publicly available now. Mm, and if not, okay. let me know, because actually we did a big, a big section on citizenship and identity, and I wrote a number of scenarios for that. So, um, Oh, fabulous. Yeah, well, I'd love out, to. Yeah, check out the IFTF.org okay. website. And, yep. let me, and if it's not there, let me know, and I'll dig, dig up what I can. Thank you. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I figured there, I figured there was a lot of, uh, a lot of residents there. Jerry, if I could jump in for a second on this. Please, Bill. The, uh, the um, phrase that I pick up on from both Jeremy Rifkin and his work, Third Industrial Revolution and um, Empathic Civilization, together with the work of David Snowden with this Kinefin framework and everything, is distributed cognition. Mm -hmm. In other words, that we're getting to a realm where there's greater and greater capacity and need for people to, to make up their own mind and have access to act based on that. In other words, we're, we're less relying on, which to me is part of the, the degradation, in other words, the paying attention to it, et cetera, is, is a degradation of that part that was always looking for somebody else to make the decision, or if they were making the decision as a government or, or a parent or whatever, that, that they're made wrong. You know, so that we can sort of go into a level through the internet and other things to find out what we really believe and what we think is the right thing to do and then act on that. And, and Jeremy Rifkin in particular thinks that that's a very important advancement to the extent that we're capable of doing that. Now, obviously, it gets really, really messy at the beginning. Yeah. But we can sense, or at least I, I feel that we can sense that if there is flexibility and trust that ultimately gets built in, which to me is what's happening with things like blockchain, where there is a potential to construct safe ways, in other words, structurally safe ways of what uh, one of the, the technology people called shared worlds. And so in that, in that sense, you, you get the ability to have distributed cognition in other words, the ability to make the decision and not have somebody else, you know, not give up your power to a political party or to a politician or, or to the school district. No, I'm going to do it myself. And, or, or, to, or to the myth makers. Right. But, but in, in a way, that becomes the new myth. In other words, we're all sort of like the bumblebees, you know, working the community in a way that's, that's safe and appropriate for the, the community of bumblebees. But at the end of the day, not necessarily being told what to do. Mm hmm and so you've got this structure that is, that is, in essence, drawing from the field, trusting in the fact that there is a field, but not expecting that it's somehow told to you. In other words, you know it. You don't, you don't have to go find a book that teaches you. And to me, that, you know, in, in our work with, with school systems, in other words, we're doing that invert the classroom so that, that, in essence, the child has control over the process and the speed with which they learn algebra or, you know, ge geometry or whatever. But at the end of the day, there's a sense of responsibility and the teacher is no longer sort of like the dictator at the front of the room telling you what's right and wrong and, and constant test taking. No, you're now in charge and you, in essence, proceed through mastery. You don't want just a pass fail. You want to master that project, that, that, that process. So in that sense, the, the student becomes more distributed cognition so that when they come out of school, they not only know to what extent they are educated, but how to stay educated because they've now taken responsibility for the process. Um, Bill, I love that. It's, uh, and I have to go look at what Rifkin's saying on this because um, this notion of distributed cognition ring resonates a lot for me. I talk a lot about collaborative sense making. Um, a very specific, sort of a, a spe specific example of this is just a yeah. simple aspect of how do you get energy. In other words, the United States is focused on General Electric and Florida Power and Light and Con Ed having control and controlling the grid, which obviously, if anybody is following that, is very uh, not resilient, very subject to you know potential damage by outside terrorists and stuff like that. Whereas in Europe, they've spent the last 10 years with the guidance of Jeremy Rifkin, creating a very, very, very flexible distributed process of energy. They've essentially got an internet of energy in Europe, you know, based on the fact that they've got 150,000 public buildings that are all wired to create their own energy and they can share it to anybody. 
they're so far ahead of us. It's 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 not even funny. You Love know? that. Love that. Very interesting. Um, you also mentioned blockchain, and I was thinking earlier um, when we were talking about myths and myth making that uh, I sometimes think of uh, Aboriginal song lines as the original blockchain, because basically these, these song lines go back, you know, tens of thousands of years. Um, and they're, they're both descriptions of the birth story of the culture and their descriptions of the landscape that they cross and they include property rights along the way. Uh, like, you know, so-and-so has the right to graze in this area or whatever else. And they include other things. I think we don't, we don't even really understand, you know, also which, which rock or tree is which spirit uh, behind and how do you deal with them? But but they're additive. They're basically incremental and they're told this, this goes back to this notion of oral tradition um, and the building of sort of long, really long duration history of different kinds. So I, I, I'm interested because the blockchain is both uh, a bonanza and this crazy boondoggle and we're seeing everybody reinventing everything on top of it right now from completely different frames of mind and with very different intentions uh, you know, all of, all of which are kind of co coalescing, co collapsing, converging on this blockchain sort of thing. And then we are, we are friends with Arthur Brock and the Holochain team, which has a different approach toward doing it and very different intentions from most of the other efforts. And that's interesting. And I think we should probably have a pop-up call uh, with Matthew and Gene and a couple other people. Uh, oh my God, they should have called it the blockchain. You're so right, Jamey. They should have shouldn't should have skipped hold the chain. They should have just called it the Brock chain. Um, uh, so so I think that's all all interesting, and it, it actually leads me to my check in, which I, I haven't done yet, and I'd like like to sort of take a, a turn here doing, which is uh, one of the one of the larger things in front of me right now is kind of doing a community analysis for this exponential organizations foundation that I'm part of, with Salim Ismail and a and a small crew, uh, and we're trying to figure out. Um, how do we uh, how do we assess which communities we're interested in connecting with, which communities we're interested in building, and how? Uh, where are they aimed? What are their purposes? Uh, what are their rituals? What do they do? I'll actually point to everybody uh, community-canvas.org. I'm actually not on our on our Zoom chat because I've got the Zoom on my iPad over there, but Community Canvas is a really really interesting resource for assessing uh, aspects of different communities. It's a they took the business model canvas and they completely rearranged everything, but they've split things up on community formation and management and participation in I, I think a really useful set of questions. Um, so uh, going there is actually quite good. So a piece of what I'm trying to think about is. Uh, an important piece of this thinking on communities is how do we bridge across high function communities? How do we, um, how do we help various communities synchronize their activities a little bit where it matters without becoming one big blob of a community, without homogenizing, without, without destroying the requisite variety that that variety gives us. Um, and so I'm, I'm puzzling on that. And would, you know, any suggestions, any any thoughts on that are extremely welcome. And on, on the on the rest of this, but um, trying to do that. And then uh, the other big thing on my horizon is a, the PDF keynote I have in in early mid June, uh, where I'm I'll be talking about trust and where I'm basically trying to say that <clears throat> I think trust is the only way forward, even though even though it's easy to prove how untrustworthy humans are and how scary crowds are, that, that finding our way back to trust is in fact our, our only path forward. Uh, and this in an environment where um, many groups of people have discovered that the breaking of trust intentionally and the creating of fog on the battlefield is a really good strategy for winning control uh, and, and generating fear and breaking safety and all of those kinds of things. So, um, that's, that's heavy in my mind right now, how to explain that, what stories to tell about it in particular, um, what stories to tell to illustrate uh, those kinds of points. So one that's kind of where you might, Brian, one thing you might go ahead. Consider, Jerry, to drill down on that is to um, tease out what's the difference between trust and faith? 
Mm -hmm. If you do trust a system, do you have faith in the system? And mm -hmm. what are the different outcomes when you, from those two very similar but not quite identical uh, perspectives? Yeah, and 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 faith also as a weapon against trust in a weird way. Like um, long ago, I had a conversation with a Jordanian driver and kind of got into it a little bit. And, and we were like, well, we were talking about the Bible and the Quran and this and that. And he's like, well, well, have you read these things? We asked him and he says, well, yes, I've read them. And, well, what do you mean exactly? Well, he'd read the Quran and the Quran by definition includes all other works. So you don't need to read anything else. Right. And, the, and it's an act of faith to believe that just as it's an act of faith to believe in the stories of the Bible or other myths that we, that we propagate or the myths of your particular culture and origin story. Um, and whether or not there is, you know, uh, some aspect of the divine and, and how the divine in fact is architected, whether it's a duality or a Trinity or, a, or, you know, all those, all those kinds of questions uh, go back to this, but, but faith in that, in the context I just related was a way of uh, controlling what he thought and making sure he didn't go read other things uh, outside of the boundaries of his cultural um, surroundings. It was very interesting. So I, I like the question a lot, Jemaine. Any other, any other thoughts from anyone else? I've just been listening to the uh, Constitutionally Speaking podcast. Uh, which I'm finding really fun. But the episode that I listened to yesterday is about James Madison designing for distrust. Mm. And it just hadn't really, you know, never thought through a bunch of this stuff. And yeah, it kind of, the basis was he doesn't trust anybody. He thinks, you know, everybody's going to do bad shit. And so that's how you get the U.S. Constitution. And, uh, and so the, the, the session has a lot, you know, it's like Jefferson kind of trusts everybody. Hamilton kind of trusts you no know, more people. Madison doesn't trust anybody. So anyway, I just feel like you're, you're on this historic theme that I hadn't really thought through. That's really interesting because, you know, systems of checks and balances and uh, all of those things designed into our particular framework for democracy um, are supposed to do that, right? If, if, one of the, if one of the pieces is off, the other pieces can sort of control for it in different ways. So you uh, assume malfeasance by any actor. How do you, I mean, one of the big questions here is how do you design social systems, social contracts, uh, institutional arrangements that in fact will guide toward good outcomes despite bad actors? Um, but then the question for me is, do you design around the bad actors first or last? Right? Do, do, you, do you try to design the system so that bad actors can't do anything which means you limit the actions of everybody or do you create very open systems where you know there's going to be bad actors and then figure out how to, how to deal with the bad actors later? Don't, don't you think that that's the point of blockchain? You, you start with the assumption that you want to define what a, a good outcome is and then lock it in. In other words, there's nothing but a good outcome that can come from it. You know, in other words, that's the concept behind it. So uh, it's, that's what have people, people, people want that kind of trust even at the big, big, big institutional level, they can't trust each other. And so they want to structure something so that whatever it is that's supposed to be happening won't happen except in the way that they want it to happen. And the, one of the um, things that I posted is uh, this guy, Lehman Baird, who's got the process called the hash graph, which is supposedly even more fluid and more control reliable than blockchain is. In other words, there's, there's less work to be done to keep the, the trust there. But he actually calls his program or process shared worlds because mm. you literally create your entire world with your own criteria, your own values, and don't deal with, don't work with, don't allow anybody into your network if they don't agree with your rules, mm -hmm. which answers your question. You know, we, we, these are our rules. If you want to play with me, you've got to follow these rules and, and things cannot happen other than in accordance with these values. Um, Lehman Baird, L-E-E-M-O-N, Baird, B-A-I-R-D, Hashgraph. Right. Uh, it's interesting stuff. I haven't gone deep enough into it. Um, the, the best are YouTube interviews to, to listen to him talk about it because there, mm -hmm. there is a lot of, it, it's a very technical 
process, but it's been vetted for years, for like over 30 years, the, 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 the concept behind it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, ha I have um, Hashgraph in my brain under a thought called alternatives to blockchains, right. which, include, which includes Holochain and some of the metacurrency right. stuff that Arthur's been working on, and also interestingly includes Chia, Swirls, and Urban. Swirls is Lehman, Lehman Barrett is Swirls. That's oh, that's also, that's also him, okay. Right. Cool, you're right, Lehman Barrett. So it's connected to the Hashgraph. I need to, in fact, I had it under Hashgraph. Cool. Um, so there's a whole world of things to go exploring in there. Cool. Um, any other thoughts on those things? Uh, any, any wrapping thoughts, any comments on the kinds of themes that came up while we were talking? Um, I haven't done a check-in yet, Jerry. Oh, <laughs> Jamie, I apologize. Would you like to check in? <laughs> Certainly. Um, well, it's actually, this is a, uh, a, um, provi providential moment because I'm working right now on a, uh, stuff for the future of trust at, uh, Institute for the Future. And I'm writing a set of forecasts, but the one that I'm, that I'm wrestling with right now is essentially asking the question, when do we want our systems, whether we're talking institutional or digital, when do we want our systems to lie to us? You know, and so I you know, start with an example. An elderly patient in a memory care facility asks when her husband, who had died seven years earlier, will visit. The woman's healthcare assistants, whether a human nurse or a digital interactive device, will need to answer her. Should she be told the truth and suffer the loss again, even though she'll ask the same question tomorrow or even a few hours later? Or should she be told a lie that he'd be back later on today, mm -hmm. knowing that she'll forget this answer soon? So that's just something where the humane response seems to be to lie, where that's the correct approach. It's, you know, at least that's the way it's seen for a lot of people. And so that's what's got me thinking about when do we want our systems to lie to us? You know, when is it better to be deceived? Yeah, you know, and I think there's an, ex an example that a lot, of, a lot of us probably have experienced. How, um, if you ever put your alarm clock five minutes forward or mm -hmm. 10 minutes forward right. to like get yourself up early in the morning, you know, you're basically, get, you're actually telling this machine to lie to you and you're doing it know knowingly. And it turns out there's some really interesting research on what's known as open label placebos, mm -hmm. where it, um, the research shows that people who are given um, placebos but are told, these are placebos, here's 15 minutes on how the placebo effect works, mm -hmm. have you know, roughly similar outcomes to people who are given quote unquote deceptive placebos. Right. Placebos work even when you know it's a placebo. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so it's yeah. actually, it's bizarre. It's knowing that you're being lied to, you know, and so you know, we know that if, even if we know that the system is lying to us, that doesn't necessarily obviate its utility. So just exploring this, this question of in a, in a world where trust is important, when is lying from our, you know, when do we want our systems to lie to us? Which then sort of bleeds into this, the, the question of, you know, when we have intelligent or functionally intelligent systems, when do we want them to say no mm -hmm. or to, uh, to misrepresent themselves? And it's easy, to, it's easy to imagine uh, a, a financial planning app that basically says, you know, you, you've run out of money when in fact there's still something in, in, the, in the bank, but it would convince you to maybe not spend money on something you're about to. It's easy to uh, imagine an exercise app that tells you you've run three miles when you've only run two, but you're trying to get to some goal, whatever it is, right? But that there right. might be sort of mixed incentives in, in the coaching aspects of apps. Well, it's done for, sometimes it's done for your safety. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. a car that has that actually still has another half gallon of gasoline in the tank, but it tells you that you're, at, you're close to empty. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically to give you that little margin of error. It's, um, it's, you know, it's interesting also to me, it, it really does get back to trust again because there's the assumption that it's lying to me for my own good. Once you open up the door to lying, how do I know who's good at you're doing it for? Right, right. You know, so um, 
you know, it, so actually an example of that is that I came up with is, do we want our self-driving, so the, there's a question, do we want our self-driving cars to break the law, to, mm -hmm. to speed? Every, pretty much everyone speeds, uh, certainly in California, you know, and that's, and I mean that even driving a couple of miles an hour over the speed limit, that's technically breaking the law. Mm -hmm. And so we're accustomed to that. So do we want our self-driving vehicles, do we want to program them to break the law? Or do we want them to show us a speed of 70 in a 65 zone, but still actually only drive 65? So that you know, we have that, that visceral response of, yes, we're, we're driving as fast as I would be driving as a human, even though the machine itself is remaining you know, technically legal. So you know these and, kinds of these kinds of issues are do, and who's that good for? Is that that's you know arguably not good for you as the driver slash passenger uh, because you're actually it's going to be slower to get where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, it's better for the the community to have everyone driving at a at a slower speed. Well, I can imagine arteries in the future. Maybe they're like freeways. Maybe they're, they're streets where only robo cars operate. Oh, yeah. Where, oh, yeah. Where, the, where the speed limit is flexible and just keeps creeping upward as performance and safety and, and all those things, you know, get better. But as long as you have a mixed environment. Right. Um, you can't you do that. Have, you can't do that. You know, and we've, we've talked about the, you know, the other, some of the other side effects of a mixed environment with self-driving vehicles, like uh, bullying, humans bullying self-driving cars. Um, because if you know that the machine's going to get out of your way, I can, you know, change lanes without having to signal because, hey, it's not like you're going to crash into me. And then the robot can move, can uh, react much more quickly than a human can. And they don't want the bad publicity. So, uh, uh, you know, and I, I don't know if that quite fits the, what I'm talking about, but still this, this question of, it's just keeps coming back to when is deception from a system level deception useful, mm -hmm. good? Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if, if some of the issues are coming out of uh, the fact we, we kind of abstract truth and falsity to be digital and unitary things. Things are either true or false. Whereas that's actually, not, you know, even in the digital realm, when you look at the electronics, you decide on, you know, various voltage levels in the transistors and this will be, you know, one, this will be zero. Mm -hmm. So even that is kind of an abstraction. And I, I was recently in, uh, in Europe and uh, Amsterdam, among other places. And it's a really interesting experience being on the street there because there's, there's very few traffic lights and stop go signs and so on. And there's pedestrians, lots of bicycles, and everyone is driving uh, with very kind of narrow margins of safety. Uh, and this is all happening in a very tacit sort of way. And then you contrast that with, you know, I come back here and then there's a red light, everyone stops, there's a green light, everyone goes, everyone stops even though there's no traffic going. And so you, you're, you're trying to kind of have very tightly bound abstractions that guard, guide behavior, but those are actually abstractions. And I think they're only necessary because maybe there's not enough trust in the capacity of human beings to know what is the good, so to speak. So that, so, that reminds me of a, uh, something that I know happens to a certain extent in, in, in the Netherlands, and that is the absence of obvious demarcation between street and sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that drivers become more careful if they don't have that explicitly laid out for them. And it, it makes me wonder, is there a fear component to being trustworthy. So yes, 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 and yes. Uh, in 2006, I interviewed Hans Mondermann in, in Holland, and I posted a bunch of videos on YouTube that are him touring me and another journalist, uh, walking and driving through the town of Drachten, which he had helped re-engineer in this way. Uh, his notions of traffic calming, also now called sh shared spaces, have trickled all over the place. So it's really interesting that Holland is where you were telling the story from because that's, that's where he started. And one of the things he did was make it ambiguous where the street ends and where the sidewalk starts. Because when you have a, a six inch rise to a concrete platform where there's supposed to be pedestrians, that hard, that hard border actually makes it easier for me to just cruise along way too fast on the street, right? So part of what he was doing was trying to create a little sense of 
he needs clarity of reading what's there. So if there's a playground, he wants you to see the playground as you're driving by, but he needs a little bit of ambiguity so, so that it looks more dangerous for you, the driver, as you're driving through. So that the road looks narrower than it may actually be. And so that it looks like there are people closer to you so you might hit them um, without actually endangering them. So, there, so one of the, and, I, and this is a, one of the examples I use all the time of design from trust. Right, because what you're doing is you're trusting that the humans are going to make eye contact as they approach. And and you know, one of the traffic circles he walked us through, and he walks when he demos these things, he walks backward through the traffic circle just to show that like people are paying attention, they're not going to kill me. And when he died in 2008, it was not of a car accident; it was of prostate cancer, unfortunately. Um, but he's making the point that we're trusting that humans will actually make contact with each other and make their way through these obstacles that are streets and intersections and whatnot. And the, one of my big conundrums with robocars is it's impossible to make eye contact with a robocar. And, and robocar, the robocar future I now see coming, for sure, really mucks around with this entire future of us collaborating with each other as we make our way through the world. It completely screws with that. Um, so that leads to alternate you know, designs for the city, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, traffic lights and then, uh, and then a radar gun and then a camera and then an automatic ticket from the city when you speed through the intersection is designed from mistrust with the addition of affordances, the kind of stuff that Mondermann was busy removing from, from streets and intersections through careful redesign for trust. Go ahead, Jimmy. We need to develop white sclera for robocars. That is the, yes. the, the whites of the eye. That's something that is functionally unique to humans in primates. Yep. Um, I, I like that's, that. That's an evolutionary adaptation that helped to encourage um, sociality. So, uh, because, by the way, know, I, I can see where you're looking. You can see where I'm looking from a distance. And other animals don't have the whites of their eyes. Uh, not, not to the extent that humans do. Right. If you look right. at if you look at a chimpanzee, if you look at a gorilla, it's a much darker. Which is actually, if you ever saw the more the most recent iterations of the Planet of the Apes movies, that was one of the things that distinguished um, the the Caesar character, is that that you know the, whatever the treatment was that made him smart, also gave him white sclera. Interesting. That's really interesting. And so, um, I mean, but, but what you're saying, basically that ability to see at a distance where someone is looking, we need to you know, give that to vehicles so we can see where we can basically con confirm that I've made eye contact with the car. It sees me. Exactly. And the, the story I just told about Mondermann and traffic calming is one of the birth narratives of Rex, by the way, mm. just to go, to go back in our conversation here. I, I used to tell this all the time. Um, and then also I was thinking, well, if we can't make eye contact with cars, I had a much less effective solution for how do we deal with more conservative driving robocars? And my answer was paint the outline of a little old lady in the windows so that it looks like someone who can barely look over the wheel is, is like <laughs> behind the wheel. And everybody who's all the humans interacting with that vehicle will slow down because they're like, geez, you know, it's, it's, it's naturally going to drive slowly. But I like the sclera like headlights with sclera that actually make eye contact with you and maybe wink at you? Yeah, or, or some kind of indication where you get the, the eye contact. It's basically, it's basically, I've seen you and this is how I'm going to act given where we are in relation to each other. That's what you need to know, right? right. And, 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 I've, got the, I've got an example from New Jersey, Rich. Yeah. New Jersey has its own traffic rules, right? Jug and handles? The, well, the circles, the New Jersey circles. Yeah. And the rule for a circle is if you make eye contact, you have to yield. So you, you try not to look. Like, <laughs> wow, that's, that's so interesting. It's the opposite of what it should be. That's incredible. It's Jersey, right? Yeah, it's Jersey. Jersey. There's that one and then the Jersey jump is the first left gets right away. So Somebody said that to me in California the other day. I was like, what the fuck? I've never, you know, yeah. you've never seen that side of Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my apologies for, for forgetting that you had not checked in, Jermaine. That's, that was That's bad. Okay. I should have, should have asked around. But that was really super, super fun because you tied a bunch of stuff together, too. I do my best. Uh, anybody else with thoughts for Jermaine on his quest into trust? And lies. Trust and lies. When, do we, when is it good to, for our systems to lie to us? When do we want that to happen? Truth, lies, and video streaming. Yeah, exactly. 
All right. Okay. Well, um, well, thank we you. I are... just wanted to basically throw that out there for people. Yeah, thank you. And, and anybody who has a thoughts, put it on the Rex list or send it to Jermay directly or whatnot. Um, I just want to say thank you. This, this, you know, this check-in process really works. It's, uh, it's interesting and we, we wind up helping each other and, and learning about what we're up to and it feels very Rexy. So I, I want to thank everybody for participating. Any, any last thoughts, last words? Then let's be careful out there and uh, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.